Okay, back in town and sorry for the late start. Quick update on the final. I keep forgetting to send an email about this but just based on the feedback that I've gotten. Several people like the idea of being able to do an RO3 or something rather than a traditional final, but a number of other people, particularly like undergraduates and master's students, pointed out that, that may be less relevant to them than it would be for a doctoral student, <clears throat> which is a fair point. So what I'm leaning toward now is just making the written portion optional that you either I'll give this final that I normally do, just like four or five tricky data analysis questions, and you have the option of either doing the entire final or the option of writing the grant proposal, in which case you can just choose one of the final questions to answer or something like that. So the idea is then you don't have to do the entire final. If writing a grant proposal is more useful for your future career than doing this final is. So, I'll send an email for feedback about that, but that's the direction that I'm leaning towards. And also, homework four was due last Friday. We're still in the grace period, and I'm going to try to post homework five sometime in the next day or two. Well, anyway, today we're going to continue the discussion that Erica started last week of stuff that can go wrong in regression and what to do about it. And today and Wednesday, we're going to be talking about multicollinearity specifically. Because this is one of the most common, perhaps the most common issue that you run into when you're doing regression, particularly multivariate regression. And it's a tricky problem to deal with. And frankly, in the published literature, people handle it incorrectly all the time. So I thought it was worth discussing some of the new methods that exist for dealing with multicollinearity. So, quick review, what is multicollinearity? The idea behind multicollinearity is, say, you have a series of x variables that are strongly correlated with one another. That implies that if you have three x's that are almost perfectly correlated, if you have one x, that gives you pretty much all the information that you're going to get about y. Adding a second x doesn't tell you much more about y. And in fact, it can make your predictions of y worse because it adds more variance to your model and without, gi without giving you any additional information about y. So when you've got multicollinearity, trying to figure out the optimal regression model can be really tricky. And this is especially a common issue when you're dealing with modern high-throughput genetic data if you frequently get a very large number of possible predictor variables and figuring out how to combine them to predict who's going to develop the disease or whatever is a very challenging problem. And what happens if there's multicollinearity that you don't adjust for? Well, your estimated regression coefficients will have high variance and your predictions of why will also have high variance is the big problem, and there's several specific issues that can go along with that, as I hopefully screamed about enough a week ago, if you've got multicollinearity, a truly significant predictor can have non-significant p-values. We saw that with the long-way data that we'll see here again in a second, that we found there was no the, the multivariate regression model indicated there was no relationship between GDP and employment, even though anyone who knows about economics would say that that doesn't make any sense. It's just because the variance of the estimates becomes so large that your power to detect a non-zero coefficient becomes poor. So, and you can also get the magnitude of your coefficient can be wrong. You can even get the sign of your coefficient wrong in extreme cases. I mean, we saw that with the stack loss data that the coefficient for acid flow went from positive to negative in the multivariate model. It also makes your coefficients difficult to interpret. I mean, in general, the, co the interpretation you like to make of your regression coefficients is if a given variable has a slope of B1, then you want to say, well, if you hold everything else constant, increase x1 by one unit, 
then y increases by b1 units. Well, in the presence of multicollinearity, it's hard to say that because you can't really hold one x constant if all the x's are highly correlated with one another. Anytime one x increases, all the other x's will increase. And other ways that you can get into trouble is when you try to predict y. And as you'll recall from Erica's lecture last week, that if you try to predict y based on an unusual value of x, that observation will tend to be highly influential and it will throw off all your other predictions of y. And your prediction of y for that particular x is likely to be extremely inaccurate. Well, multicollinearity you can think of it as all your x's are correlated with one another. So basically all the x's lie on the same line or the same plane or hyperplane in high dimensional space. So that basically means if you choose an x that's not an outlier, an x that's on that straight line, somewhere actually a set of x's since we have multiple variables here, then you shouldn't have a major issue. But if you choose an x that's off of this line where all the points that clump together, then that'll be a highly influential observation, and it can make all of your y predictions inaccurate. And it's very hard to know if there's x's that, are, that don't fall on a given line in high dimensional space. It's Once you go beyond two dimensions or so, it's really difficult to visualize. So bottom line is that when you have multicollinearity, then your predictions of y can be messed up and it's difficult to adjust for that. And when you try to predict y based on a reasonably large number of x's, then this multicollinearity problem becomes pretty much unavoidable. Once, I mean, unless you deliberately design your x's to be uncorrelated with one another, usually once you get past about three, four, five variables, coral, some sort of correlation becomes almost inevitable. And when I'm fitting a regression model, I usually just assume that multicollinearity is a problem once I get past about three, four, five predictors. In the really extreme case, if the number of predictors is greater than the number of observations, say you're doing a microarray experiment, you have 30,000 genes trying to predict 100 Ys, <coughs> then there's no longer even a unique set of regression coefficients. There's actually an infinite number of possible regression coefficients, all of which will give you a sum of squared errors of zero. And when you have a large number of predictors, there's also a danger of overfitting that even if the number of predictors is less than the number of observations, as the number of predictors approaches the number of observations, then your error will get closer and closer to zero. In fact, if you've taken linear algebra, then you know that given n predictors and n observations, in most situations, there's exactly one set of coefficients that will give you an error of zero in that case. And in that case, that solution is almost certainly overfit. If you don't make any sort of adjustment for multicollinearity, you can get models that do very well on the data set that were used to predict the model, but will do poorly when applied to future data sets. As you'll recall, overfitting is when you, you develop a model that works really well on the data used to fit the model, but poorly on future data sets. This is a simple example of this, say that you're trying to fit some sort of regression type model to predict y based on x, and the data looks like this. Well, in Plot B here, that's an example of a model that's underfit because the true association is curvilinear. You're modeling it as a linear function. So there's going to be systematic error in the model. Something like model C would be closer to reality. Model D would be an example of a model that's overfit where you're basically just interpolating the points. When you interpolate the points, obviously, for the data set that you use to fit the model, you get an error of zero. But 
if you generated new data from the same distribution, applied this model to that data, the model's likely to perform poorly because the new set of data points won't follow the exact pattern that you see here, and you'll get high error. And that's the issue that we run into with multicollinearity, that if you have a high number of predictors, it's easy to develop a model that works really well for the model that you use to fit the data, but works poorly if you apply it to future data sets. Now oh, remember the Longley data where you're trying to predict the number of people who are employed based on various factors related to employment level, the gross national product, total population of the country, and so forth, and you get extremely collinear predictors, which makes the resulting regression model difficult to interpret. Here's the output from this model for your recollection. Recall we see weird things like Neither of the measures of GNP are associated with employment under this model, and the coefficient for GNP is negative, as is the coefficient for population, suggesting that as the population gets larger, the gross national product gets larger, it's less people employed, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Basic issue is that all these variables are so strongly correlated with one another, you throw them all in a regression model and you start to see weird stuff like that. So how do you know if multicollinearity is a problem? Well, I mean the simplest way is to just duck the entire issue. Just assume if you've got about four or five variables in your model, multicollinearity is a problem and less unless there's reason to believe otherwise. So once I'm fitting a regression model with more than a couple variables in it, I don't even bother to test for multicollinearity. I just assume that it's going to be an issue. So I try to take the appropriate steps to deal with it. But if you're not sure, you can look at pairwise correlations or pairwise scatter plots to see if given axes are correlated with one another, and as I'll show you how to do here in a second. To calculate pairwise correlations, you can use the core command in R. Uh, if you say core in R, if you say core and then give it a data frame, it automatically calculates the pairwise correlations between every two columns in the data frame. So. The correlation between GNP and GNP deflator is about 0.99, so absurdly strongly correlated with one another, and GNP deflator is equally strongly correlated with the, most of the other variables population year employed. Almost perfect correlation with all of them. The only thing that's more weakly correlated is the number of people in the armed forces and so on for these other pairwise correlations. If you do correlations that look like this and they're all like 0.9 or higher, yeah, multicollinearity is going to be a major deal. Now, luckily, for almost all practical problems, you're not going to see correlations that high, but I just chose an extreme example to make this easy to see. The other way to do a SINAR is with the pairs command that I think we briefly discussed last week that will give you pairwise scatter plots that look like this. Once again, it's consistent with what we saw on the previous slide that GNP deflator and the correlation with the armed forces is a little bit weak, but you see an almost perfect straight line relationship between GNP deflator and all the other variables. Once again, when you see strong correlations like that in the pairwise scatter plots that tells you that your variables are highly collinear. And like I said, the one shortcoming of both the correlation matrix and the pairwise scatter plots is they'll only figure out pairwise correlations. If you have like a linear combination of variable 1 and variable 2 equals variable 3, you won't necessarily see that. And 
for a small number of variables, you should still pick up on that sort of thing to a certain degree, but for larger numbers of variables, you won't necessarily. This is why I just say, for a reasonably large number of variables, assume that collinearity is going to be a problem, because it almost always is. And quick review of the R commands, if you say core of X, that will calculate all possible parallelized correlations of each of the columns in a data frame in R. And if you say pairs of X, where X is a data frame, then it'll plot all possible pairwise scatter plots. So, if you've got multicollinearity in your data set, what can you do about it? Well, <clears throat> one possible solution is nothing. That if you're not concerned about getting accurate estimates of the coefficients, you're mainly interested in predicting why, and you're careful to make sure that you're not doing any extrapolation in predicting why, then you may not need to do anything at all. Multicollinearity will give you higher variance in your regression coefficients, and can give you higher variance in your predictions of why, but if all the whys that you're trying to predict are on consist on this hyperplane where all the points lie, then your predictions of why are okay, and you may not be a problem, and it may not be an issue. Problem with this is that means that you can't make predictions on any X's that are quote-unquote outliers, and how do you know if your particular X is an outlier? Well, that's really tough to do once you get past more than a couple variables. So it's this approach is dangerous in the vast majority of cases, and if you have large number of predictor variables, it's not even an option. I mean, if you have 30,000 genes in your microarray study, then there isn't even a unique solution to your regression model if you try to use conventional regression methods. So you have to do something in that particular case. Another possible solution is to collect more data. As I said before, the big problem with multicollinearity is it increases the data in your model. Well, as your sample size increases, that decreases the data, the variance in your model. So in principle, you can make the multicollinearity problem go away by just collecting a larger sample size. Well, that's fine in theory and practice. That's not always a viable solution. In almost all real-world problems, collecting more data costs money. If you don't have the money to collect more data, you can't do it. And sometimes you can't do it even if you have more money. If you're doing a study on cancer and want to see if the expression of certain genes is associated with metastasis, for instance, well, your sample size cannot be larger than the number of samples that you have in your freezer. And if your hospital has 150 samples of the cancer of interest in the freezer, there's no good way to collect more short of waiting 100 years for more people to come in with the same type of cancer. And so if you're doing a microarray study where you have 30,000 genes, and you want to increase your sample size, the point multicollinearity doesn't matter, you would probably need on the order of millions of subjects. And if you've gotten a total of 100 subjects in your hospital over the last 30 years, then <clears throat> you will certainly be dead, and most likely the sun will burn out before there will be enough people in your sample size to make the multicollinearity problem go away. Um, in some situations, that can help deal with the issue, but most practical situations, it's not a viable option. Oh, another possible solution that gets used all the time in the literature, even though in my personal opinion it's a bad idea most of the time, is to do variable selection. I'm going to introduce it to you because it gets used all the time in the literature, so I feel like you need to know about it. But my personal opinion is it's anachronistic at this point. There are other ways to solve this problem that are better, and I'll explain why I don't like variable selection here in, the me in a minute. But the basic idea behind variable selection is that rather than using all of your predictor variables, you try to find some optimal subset 
of your predictor variables to include in the model. And the motivation behind this is if your predictors are correlated with one another, if you prune your full list of variables down to some subset of variables, you lose very, informa very little information about why, you get lower variance and hence better predictions. In theory, that's fine. In practice, you run into a number of issues, as I'll illustrate here in a second. One approach is all subsets regression that I'll just briefly introduce for historical reasons. I think pretty much nobody uses this anymore. The, the way to do all subsets regression is you examine all possible subsets of the x variables where basically if you have m variables each variable can either be included in the model or not included in the model so obviously that gives you a total of 2 to the m possible models. You rank the models from the best fitting model to the worst fitting model, choose the best fitting model. Why is this a bad idea? Well, first of all, from a purely practical perspective, as I said, it requires fitting 2 to the m models, which if m is 5, that's 32 models, not the end of the world, but once you get to about m of 15 or 20, that's going to require you to fit so many models that your computer is going to be running for days or months or whatever. If you have 30,000 models in a microarray experiment, you try to fit two to the m different models, the sun's going to burn out before that finishes. So it's only a viable solution if m is relatively small, and in particular, if the number of predictors is greater than the number of observations, it doesn't solve the problem anyway. And it will also almost certainly give you a model that's really badly overfit because you take the data set that you use to build the model, find the best set of M predictors, or find the best subset of predictors for that particular data set. It doesn't necessarily guarantee that you'll find the best predictors for data sets outside the data that you use to fit your model. So you almost certainly end up with an overfit model. So as I say, I haven't seen any papers or anything where anybody used this in a very long time. I'm just tossing it out there in case you do see it for some strange reason. Another approach which unfortunately still does get used all the time in the literature is what's called stepwise regression which the idea behind stepwise regression is rather than fitting all two to the m possible models, you take a shortcut using what's known as the greedy algorithm in the computer science literature that basically means you just add or remove one variable at a time. And there are various flavors of this, like forward stepwise regression is the most commonly used which means that you start with no predictors in the model other than an intercept, then you add the variable that's most strongly associated with y, then keep adding variables that give the biggest increase in r squared to increase the predictive accuracy of the model as much as possible at each step. Or there's backward stepwise regression, which is basically the same idea in reverse. You start with everything in the model, then you remove the variables one at a time, seeing which variables deletion causes the smallest reduction in R squared, and then keep doing that. There's various different stopping criteria that once adding another variable to the model to isn't giving you much of an increase or decrease in R squared, then you stop. I won't bore you with the details. Like I said, I'm not a big fan of this in the first place. And sometimes people will do combined forward and step, backward stepwise regression, which means like you basically do back y, backward stepwise regression, but at each step you do some testing to see if there's anything that you got rid of that should be included in the model once again. And why do I dislike variable selection so much? Well, 
Overfitting is still a really bad problem for starters. You're finding a set of variables that gives you good predictions for predicting why on the data that you're using to generate the model. There's no guarantee that it will generalize well the future data sets. And the variables that get selected are often extremely arbitrary that Take the Longley date, if you do stepwise regression, how do you choose between GNP and GNP deflator when they have a correlation of 0.99 with one another? Basically, the procedure just kind of grabs one pretty much at random. If you change your date even slightly, it will grab a different set of variables. Well, it's difficult to interpret the variables that get selected. And People have a bad habit in papers of over-interpreting the variables that get selected. And another thing that gets overlooked all the time in the literature, and that I always tear my hair out when I see, is that if you do stepwise regression, the t-statistics and f-statistics are completely and totally meaningless. Now, a lot of people don't know that. I see people writing papers or giving talks all the time where they make this mistake, but... If you do stepwise regression, you cannot and should not report the t-statistics. Remember, the idea behind the t-statistic is that for sufficiently large n, if you divide the regression coefficient by its standard error, that should be, have approximately a normal distribution. When you do stepwise regression, the t-statistics will not have a normal distribution anymore, not have a t-distribution at any rate. You have this really bizarre distribution it has a huge point mass at zero, which corresponds to the times when it doesn't get included in the model. Then the times when it does, that thing will have a t-distribution. Now, what's the distribution of this weird thing that has a point mass at zero plus a t-distribution? It beats me, but it sure as heck isn't a t-distribution. So, if you report a t-statistic for a stepwise regression model, it's wrong. But, unfortunately, it happens all the time anyway. I mean, the conference I was at last week, I was listening to a talk where this guy was trying to give a presentation on risk factors for orofacial pain and basically did a stepwise regression. And what he did in that was even worse, that, like, he selected certain variables that he thought were important, like age and gender and a few things like that, and then did a stepwise on everything else. When he did that, like age and gender turned up as being non-significant in the model, and he ended up with a couple of weird things significant, and then he tried to come to a conclusion, like, age and gender don't matter, but all these three weird things do matter, and all these other things that we expect to be important don't matter. It's like, Argh! so many problems here that, number one, what he's basically doing is he's comparing age and gender to the very best variables from the long list of another set of variables. It's like, recall if you have like a list of 100 variables, some of them are going to give small p-values just by random chance. So he was taking a certain fixed set of variables, comparing them to a couple of other variables that got lucky. And on top of that, recall this issue that if you have two variables highly correlated with one another, it tends to just select one of the two by random chance, and the one that gets selected is highly arbitrary. And he was trying to tell the story that, I'm trying to think of an example here, that looked like some psychological variables and said, like, depression was associated with pain, but anxiety was not. Well, problem is depression and anxiety are highly correlated with one another. So the fact that it picked one of the two out and didn't pick the other out doesn't necessarily mean anything. So trying to conclude from this that anxiety doesn't matter because the stepwise model picked depression instead is potentially highly misleading. So my personal opinion, stepwise regression is anachronistic. There are newer methods that I'll touch on today and describe in more detail on Wednesday that are superior to stepwise models in pretty much every possible way. The only reason stepwise models still get used is because they still get taught in introductory statistics courses, whereas the more modern methods that I'm going to teach you later don't. So hopefully you learn the modern methods and use the modern methods in the future rather than this.
But, like I said, I feel like I need to teach it to you because it does get used all the time in papers and hopefully when you're listening to talks or reviewing papers and people do this, then you can scream at them and we can finally get this method given its proper burial. Oh, if you have to do us in R for some horrible reason that your PI insists on it or whatever, the command to do it in R is called STAP. The basically the simplest way to do it is to do backwards stepwise regression in R. You just fit the full model and I, I do it longly data and save it in a variable called longly.lm. Then I apply the command STAP to longly.lm. It gives this model here where it prunes some of the more redundant variables. You see gnp.deflator is gone and I forget what other variables are gone. And I mean there's still some weird results here like the coefficient for gnp is still negative which I personally have a hard time believing. And there's also the larger problem that, as I said, that these standard errors, t-values, and p-values are meaningless at this point, despite the fact that people report them all the time. But it is kind of interesting if you note the r-squared here compared to the r-squared in the previous slide. There's almost no reduction whatsoever, indicating that at the bare minimum, the stepwise regression lets you prune out a couple variables with minimal loss and predictive accuracy, but that's about the only thing this particular method has to recommend it as far as I'm concerned. And in general in R, if you go step of lm.object where lm.object is the output from the lm command, it'll do backward stepwise regression you can also tweak it to do forward stepwise, but that's kind of a pain to code and since I don't think it's something you should be using anyway. I'm not going to explain how to do it. And by default, if you use the step command in R, it will print out every single model that it, cons that it considered as it's stepping through the entire thing. If you don't want to see 10 pages of output of every model that it tries, then you can add this command trace equals fault, and then it won't print out all the intermediate results. So like I said, if I haven't made this point clear enough before, I don't think there's any reason to use stepwise regression anymore. The I'll describe some penalized regression methods here in a minute and in more detail on Wednesday, but as far as I'm concerned, are pretty much always preferable stepwise methods. And I'm just describing this method so that you recognize it when you see it because it does get used quite a bit, unfortunately. Oh, Another solution to this problem of multicollinearity is penalized regression, which this is another one of those things that is a little bit confusing and isn't normally taught in introductory courses, but I think it's sufficiently useful and important that it's worth teaching. I mean, in my daily work, I use this all the time. I feel like it's worth knowing about so that you know about these better alternatives to stepwise regression. That the, the idea behind penalized regression is that the belief is that if a model has a small number of coefficients or smaller coefficients, it's less likely to be overfit than a model that has a large number of large coefficients. So you try so rather than using traditional linear regression you can do what we call penalized regression which penalizes models that have a large number of large coefficients how do you do that well in formal terms recall the ordinary linear regression criteria is you try to find bi hats to minimize the sum of squared errors that is 
for each yi, you subtract off the predicted value of y, which just be this quantity, square it, add all that out. Um, when you use penalized regression, only describe two forms of penalized regression today, although other forms exist. The his first form of penalized regression that was developed historically is what's called ridge regression. That ridge regression, rather than just trying to minimize the sum of squared errors, you, tr you try to minimize the sum of squared errors plus the tuning parameter lambda times the sum of the coefficient squared. The motivation behind this is, like I said, that if a model has a bunch of large coefficients, it's more likely the model's overfed. So rather than just trying to minimize the sum of squared errors, you penalize models that have a large number of large coefficients. And the idea is that you choose a model that doesn't exactly minimize the sum of squared errors, but might be less likely to be overfit since it doesn't have so many large coefficients. And this lambda basically controls the amount of penalization. If lambda equals zero, then you just get the ordinary least square solution. If lambda equals infinity, then that means that you can't have any non-zero coefficients at all other than the intercept, and you end up with an intercept-only model. And the idea is you try to choose the value of lambda such that you get the least possible amount of overfitting. I'll discuss how you choose the best value of lambda on Wednesday. And a more recent form of penalized regression, it's similar to ridge regression, is called lasso, which is the same as ridge regression, but rather than trying to minimize the sum of the squared coefficients, it just minimizes the sum of the absolute value of the coefficients. And it turns out lasso has some nice properties that Ridge doesn't have that I'll describe here in a minute that make it preferable to Ridge in certain situations. So, properties of Lasso and Ridge regression is that both of these regression estimates are biased. That, that is, the, the expected value of the coefficients that you get from Lasso and Ridge are not equal to the true parameter estimates if you simulate data or whatever, but they'll typically give you much lower variance than you would from ordinary least squares. And this is an example of something that we call the bias variance, variance trade-off in statistics. This is another somewhat confusing thing that I won't spend too much time on the one to at least give you the basic idea that bias in a model in the statistical sense is basically the difference between your statistical model and the quote-unquote true model. That if your data is quadratic and you try to fit a straight line to it, then your model is biased since you can't fit a straight line to quadratic data, that would be an example of bias. And variance is sampled sample variation in a statistical method that if you get a new sample and apply the same model to the new sample, your coefficients will change somewhat just due to sampling variability. And variance measures the amount of sample to sample variation in a statistical method. And generally speaking, you can find some exceptions to this, but most of the time there's a trade-off between bias and variance of a model. But as the bias of a model increases, the variance will decrease and vice versa. An example of the bias-variance trade-off here, like say you have quadratic data that looks like this. If you fit a straight line to this model, that would have relatively low variance. Straight line won't vary too much if you get a new sample, but it will have high bias because it obviously you can't capture quadratic data with a straight line. Or if you just interpolated the points, that will have zero bias because if you interpolate, 
you can fit any strange pattern between X and Y in principle, but it will have high variance because your model will change completely each new sample that you get. So in general, as bias increases, variance decreases and vice versa. So the basic idea behind lasso and ridge regression is that you take a model that's slightly biased that gives you lower variance and hopefully gives you more accurate predictions that way. If you didn't follow all that, don't worry about it too much. It's not something that you need to use on your day to, in your day-to-day -day life. Further properties of lasso and ridge regression is ridge will shrink your regression coefficients towards zero. The basically, as lambda increases with ridge regression, all of your coefficients will remain non-zero, but they'll get closer and closer to zero. On the other hand, for lasso, as lambda increases, some of your coefficients will start to go to zero. And so for sufficiently large lambda, you'll end up with a subset of your variables similar to what you get from stepwise regression. And that's one nice property of lasso and a reason that I say that stepwise regression is somewhat anachronistic these days. If you really want a model that uses only a subset of the variables, you can use lasso and avoid most of the overfitting problems associated with stepwise regression. So to illustrate this graphically, here the x axis here the x axis basically denotes the amount of shrinkage where I apologize, I pulled these pictures off the internet and it uses a different value of lambda than what I just put on the previous slide. Basically, when x equals 1 in this model, that implies that there's no penalization whatsoever. And when x equals 0, that implies a lambda equals infinity that you don't allow any non-zero coefficients up in the intercept. So as you can see, ridge as the amount of penalization increases, all of the variables get closer and closer to zero. They don't actually get to zero until lambda equals infinity. On the other hand, for lasso, as you can see, as the amount of penalization increases, more and more variables go to zero. First, this purple, well, I guess actually the yellow variable is the first one to go to zero. It starts out around 500, the amount of penalization decreases, it goes to zero, then this blue variable goes to zero. For lambda out here, only the red, green, and light blue variables are still non-zero. Everything else has a coefficient of zero, so if you wanted to find a model that uses only a subset of the variables, you can use lasso to find the appropriate, to find a subset and avoid the problems associated with stepwise regression. So, lasso selects a subset of the predictor variables. It's usually easier to interpret. If you want to find a small subset of variables to make predictions, lasso is clearly preferable. If you're doing like a gene expression study and you want to find a set of like five to ten genes to make predictions in the clinic, then you would want to use lasso. If you used ridge, all 30,000 genes would have non-zero coefficients, which isn't what you want. There, however, there is some folklore that ridge regression tends to give more accurate predictions than lasso. I don't know that that's ever been studied very carefully, quite honestly, but I have seen some examples of that. So you may want to consider ridge if predictive accuracy is more important than interpretability. And I'll be covering lasso and ridge regression in much more detail on Wednesday. That's just a quick introduction. The things to remember for today is if we want to predict why, based on predictors that are correlated with one another, you can get inaccurate results with ordinary linear regression. If you have a reasonably large number of predictors, which for most practical problems is more than about four or five, collinearity will also be an issue and you can try to solve it using stepwise regression or penalized regression, and I personally strongly favor the penalized approach. And new R command stay would be core, pairs, and step.
Any questions about any of this? Okay.